you managed to assemble an amazing uh, group of participants. You want to let's go down the list because I, it, it occurs to me though most people in uh, the Mormon scholarly intellectual community would know uh, all of them. Uh, some of our some people may not, uh, and so um, tell us, Richard Bushman. Let's start with Richard Bushman. We did have Richard Bushman. If there's any figure that our audience would be apt to know, it would be Richard Bushman, who is uh, one of the most celebrated and respected historians in the United States on a range of topics. He's known in this area, of course, of Mormon studies um, for a number of reasons, but principally his um, extraordinary biography, Rough Stone Rolling, of um, Joseph Smith. Um, but he was awarded when he um, was graduating from Harvard University with his PhD, he was awarded uh, the Bancroft Prize, which in the um, historical profession in this country is given to the best book on, on any topic with a few little asterisks, but most any topic um, in American history. Mm -hmm. um, so he's an extraordinary mind. He's, he taught, he was a professor at Columbia of uh, history, American history primarily, I believe. American history, the oldest um, endowed chair in the nation, uh, the Governor Morris the Governor chair, Morris of, chair right. of American history. And um, he's widely published um, uh, in, uh, on subject of American history, but we're, we know him primarily for Rough Stone Rolling, which was really a game changer uh, in Mormon history. And so if there's a dean of Mormon history today, it would probably be... He's also one of the three uh, editors of the Joseph Smith Papers, I believe, right? General editors, yeah. yeah. General Meaning editors. Helping to shape the project. He's had a, quite, a, quite a, uh, an experience in serving in the church, in, including as a state patriarch, which is probably... I think he was the only state patriarch on the panel, but he's... When I went back to Boston to go to graduate school, I had just missed him by a few months, I think, as being my stake president there. The argument you made earlier, Jared, about it's in keeping with the Mormon style, that when divine things happen, humans are involved. Mm -hmm. The whole point is not for us to just be empty vessels in which he pours his truths, but that we participate mm -hmm. in receiving them and enacting them. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to preserve above all in this whole thing is not the historicity of the Book of Mormon. We're trying to pre pre preserve the presence of God in the whole process. We want to reach God through that Book of Mormon, through the nature of the text and through the process of receiving it. So I, I'm, I'm with you. I really think when I'm in, in saying that uh, God may have just been energizing the mind of Joseph Smith to turn this out. But I will say that uh, despite all the naturalist arguments, I still do not believe that no matter what his genius, he could have done it as himself. And I, 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 what I want is a text of similar complexity produced under such primitive conditions with so little background or training or precedence to turn out his masterwork not at the end of his career, but at the beginning of his career, just as he's getting started. That, that seems to me um, really beyond uh, anything you could call natural. Thank you. Oh, is that a mic drop? Uh, another very well-known Mormon scholar, Terrell Givens, was one of the participants. Yes, Terrell is among the very high-level work among uh, scholars of Mormonism is certainly our most prolific uh, living scholar, a tremendous imagination, works like, I think um, widely known among a Mormon audience would be works like um, The God Who Weeps uh, that he and his wife Fiona read or um, The together. Crucible of Doubt. Yeah, wrote they, together. Both, they wrote that one together too, both yes. great books. And they, he and Fiona are quite a team. They've written together. Um, they also travel together and do Firesides, usually at the request of church leaders, um, and um, draw huge crowds. I actually attended attended one of those, um, and I think they've dealt really constructively with this in this era where you, you could say we're uh, an era of faith crisis among many, particularly younger people 
in the church and have had almost a, a sort of a ministry of sorts doing that. And so he teaches at the University of Richmond, professor of English and religious and religi studies. And religious studies, okay. Um, and, or and religion mm -hmm. um, has the Bostwick endowed right. chair there. Yeah. Many language theorists working in the 19th century to try to trace language to its Adamic form were convinced that the further back you go, the more compressed and concise language becomes. By the time you get to the hieroglyph, which even somebody like Hegel referred to as a, as a form of ur consciousness, you have the linguistic equivalent of a kind of neutron bomb. So that the notion being that here is this priestly emblem that has magically and mystically, oracularly condensed within itself worlds of meaning, which only a priestly power can unlock and allow to blossom into fullness. And when I think of Joseph Smith laboring over the Egyptian papyri and the whole Abrahamic cosmology that emerges out of this, it seems to me that we get a perfect understanding of how the hieroglyph was understood if we step in back of Joseph Smith and try to look toward the future through that lens, rather than has been the norm, standing at, uh, at the point of modernity and looking back at him and evaluating him through the prism of Egyptology and, and modern linguistics. Uh, Samuel Brown. Samuel Brown is a remarkable uh, human. He spends his um, professional life as an intensive care unit um, physician and researcher. Uh, has just published a recent book about um, ethics in medicine and a more compassionate practice of medicine with Oxford University Press. But he's a rare individual, despite being highly accomplished there, was trained as an undergraduate um, in classics at Harvard University and then stayed on to the Harvard Medical School and then stayed on there to be on the Harvard Medical School faculty. Um, is currently at the University of Utah um, faculty, but he, um, despite the preoccupations that all that um, suggests, he does professional level work in history, uh, Mormon history, Mormon thought, Mormon culture, and not just uh, professional level publishing in some of the best journals and with Oxford University Press, but um, being a thought leader, breaking new ground, doing some of the most imaginative work that's going on. So he's, yeah. he's quite a mind and a person. He is, and a, and a youngster. <clears throat> I don't know how old Sam is, but considerably younger than the two of us, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, also has a degree from Harvard in linguistics, I think. So it's just, I mean, he's just one of the, as all of these people are, just among the brightest individuals I've ever uh, encountered. I do note the repeated emphasis in the Book of Mormon by the authors themselves on the limitations of space, the fact that much has had to be deleted and removed, and it seems odd to me to have these funky circumlocutions that don't serve an obvious rhetorical place in a written document. Remember the model for the Book of Mormon authors is that they are writing something engraving it. So again, it's relatively unlikely to my eye that they would be making oral verbal missteps in the course of writing a text. And we could go on with Sam, but let's, let's move on. Jared to, Hickman is um, another one of those who was there, uh, a Sam-like mind. Um, yeah. He's um, received tenure recently at Johns Hopkins um, University and has um, as people who watch the film that will follow our framing of it here will recognize an uncommon uh, talent, uh, also extremely imaginative. Um, he's co-edited a recent book called Americanist Approaches to the Book of Mormon and uh, the Black Prometheus dealing with um, slavery just, uh, just was a lovely addition. Yeah, and an engaging and entertaining uh, yes, as well. uh, kinetic mind and personality. Exactly. So to think of the Book of Mormon as the product of a venture in metaphysical rather than linguistic translation uh, can powerfully illuminate not only the Book of Mormon, but early Mormonism as a whole. 
This alternative practically cries out to us when we confront the primal scene of Book of Mormon translation. With the ostensible source text sitting covered on an adjacent desk, if that, awaiting linguistic translation, Joseph Smith instead looked into a seer stone in a hat. He literally turned away from linguistic translation toward the kind of visionary experience he had always enjoyed through his stones, a visionary experience that might well be described as metaphysical translation, wafting across and into the earth in order to access spatiotemporally remote dimensions of being containing unforeseen treasures. Through his stone, Smith, I want to suggest, uh, or rather I want to suggest the Book of Mormon suggests, launched himself across space and time to ancient America and dictated from within that envisioned space-time the text of the Book of Mormon. And what that text revealed, above all, was that ancient American prophets had launched themselves across space-time in the same manner to meet him, as it were. Metaphysical translation as a transformative process either of divine revelation or sustained imagination, or perhaps both, uh, is the sign under which we might think not only of Joseph Smith's specific translation projects, such as the Book of Mormon, but his religion-making project as a whole. Um, can we think of translator, right, uh, in the Venn diagram of Joseph Smith's sort of many functions and many activities as the encompassing circle in the end, that it's this aspiration to, uh, to transgressively traver traverse space and time that accounts for pretty much everything that he, he does, everything that he is up to. We also had two very gifted um, conversation moderators that, that also made contri tremendous con contributions to the conversation. Uh, Jana Reese. Yes, I thought of both Jana and Rosalind as more than moderators, but provocateurs as well, seeding um, some questions to the panel as a whole and to um, the individual presenters um, as they had time. So um, two very bright women scholars. Uh, Jana has her, uh, was educated at Wellesley College and then at um, the Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, one of the more prominent Protestant theological seminaries in the nation where in the midst of her studies she um, discovered and explored uh, and joined the LDS Church. Yeah. Um, so that's not the most common of paths um, for such students. Uh, went on to her PhD under Randy Balmer um, at Columbia University. And she has a distinctive gift for making um, difficult to understand topics accessible and choosing disarmingly um, friendly sounding titles and approaches to her subjects. What would Buffy do? And she makes <laughs> theology and ethics out of that, um, as in Buffy the Vampire Slayer or flunking sainthood. Um, which, which I just read, love that book. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and she converted the, the Bible to uh, Twitter in, in her book, Twible, I think she, I think she calls it Twible. Yeah, uh, which, is, which is really fun. Humorous, so, but uh, actually, actually, again, the, despite the humor, um, raises implicitly interesting theological and biblical studies questions in the process of extracting the essence with a little bit of wry insight yeah. along the way to every chapter in the Bible. Yeah, love Jana. She's brilliant and just, um, but she... Um, User-friendly. User-friendly. <laughs> I am a convert to Mormonism as an adult, and for me it was all about the Book of Mormon. And it was... Uh, I used to meet with the sister missionaries in a graveyard, <laughs> which is perhaps not the most typical place to hold visionary discussions. Or it is, Sam would say. <laughs> yeah. Or it is, yes. Perhaps it's the original, exactly it's the right the place. original place yeah. to the original have the place, conversation. Yes. Um, right. But I do remember sitting with them and saying, if I am to take this seriously and believe that this book is true, that means that this ground is not what I thought it was. The ground that we are on is somehow sacred in a way I hadn't anticipated thinking of it before. 
I have since you know, modulated my views about the geography of the Book of Mormon, so I'm not making a claim about that. But I am making a claim about claims and the claim that the text has on us if we are thinking about these questions. You know, you asked, why does this matter? And I hope that it matters not only to people who take this book seriously as something more than just a product of the 19th century, but uh, as your scholar colleagues, as something that can speak to us from the ground. Uh, Rosalind Welch is yeah. um, another, she was the other conversation partner. I became a big fan as I um, read a couple of her blogs and essays in BYU studies, in Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. And uh, she is one of the most incisive um, and graceful and articulate um, minds out there. So I w I've been attracted to her mind for a good while, for several years before I had the chance to meet her. But she was a great addition. Yeah, and another young. I was telling my, <clears throat> describing her to my brother, and I said she, she has to be among the two or three brightest primary presidents in the church, I would think so. <laughs> yeah, maybe not as well known as the other panelists because she doesn't have a university position and her writing, her exquisitely surgically precise and lucid writing is, uh, has taken the form of a series of essays rather right. than books and so she may not. Plus she's early in her career, she's very young. She's yeah. young. Mm -hmm. So the first is this issue of, of orality, right? That he, he wants to underscore this point that in its original, in its first iteration in English, the Book of Mormon was spoken, not written. Um, and he presents his evidence for it, which I find fairly persuasive, and, and I like it because it chimes kind of with something else that I've noticed about the Book of Mormon, which is um, the kind of pervasive throat clearing that you hear in it, right? It, and it came to pass, and it came to pass, and other sort of forms of kind of low low semantic density language, right? Where there's a lot of words, but not that much meaning. That's very characteristic of spoken language. Whereas when you're writing, the meaning is a lot more dense. And especially, I would imagine, if you were you know, writing in a very laborious fashion. So the Book of Mormon, to me, also has the sound of an oral document that then was transcribed. Um, so, But what's at stake here? Why does it matter? Why do we even care whether whether we know if it was first first conceived orally or or written, um, on on one level that question matters because if Joseph Smith produced it orally, that probably requires a greater degree of his own agency, right? Now maybe he had somebody whispering in his ear and then he spoke it, but probably if he was speaking it rather than reading it from the supernatural teleprompter it probably brought more, would have required more of Joseph's own mind and agency there. That was intrinsically exciting to have them all on the stage together, but um, certainly the audience uh, has given us all sorts of feedback about the pleasure they took with having that sort of um, friendly probing um, by these, this caliber of yeah. person. 